good afternoon, everybody. Um, so th thanks so much for uh, uh, coming to listen to what I have to say. Um, and apologies for keeping you wait waiting slightly. I was having a good conversation with uh, Neil Johnson of Duke Walty. Um, some of you may have been sitting in on his presentation, really excited about that business um, and the long-term revenue visibility that it has um, and its ability to grow earnings and its dividend distribution at an accelerated rate. Um, and that's really what this presentation is about. Um, so here we're looking for dividend incubators targeting double digit returns. So a dividend incubator um, is what I use to refer to a business that can grow earnings at 10%, but also its distributions at 10% as well. And this is something that's quite unique to um, the small cap space. The Downing Monthly Income Fund. That's uh, the vehicle that is uh, investing in this style and that's the fund that I've been running for the last three years. Um, and it's really an extension of Downing's uh, small cap heritage. Um, so we're taking the private equity due diligence style and applying it slightly further up the market cap spectrum. But before we move on to talk about the specific examples um, to illustrate these points, I just wanted to touch on the market as a whole. And this is something that is uh, present, uh, not just in the equity income space, but across the market as a whole. But here we're using the equity income sector to illustrate the level of concentration that we're seeing. So the UK equity income sector itself, 55 billion pounds in assets under management. And that's largely come in over the last 15 years. Now, because the majority of those assets are invested in larger funds or invested by larger funds, um, these large funds have to deploy somehow and that leads them to investing in the 20 largest dividend payers in the UK. So 56% of that 55 billion pounds being invested in the same 20 positions. So it, it doesn't take much imagination to understand that actually the level of concentration and correlation between these funds is, is significant. Um, and I would argue that actually rather than paying an active management fee for one of these funds, you'd be better off buying these 20 businesses and that will give you largely the level of income return. Now, that obviously leaves a very large portion of the market that isn't being invested in uh, by these very large funds. So pretty much the whole market, in fact, so 2,500 businesses. Um, but it also means that actually, especially with the, the, the impact of MIFID 2, that we're seeing much less attention paid as we move down the market cap spectrum here on the right-hand side. Um, so we know that sell-side analysts and research is, is directed by flows and the commissions that they can, they can make off of those flows. And of course, as we know that all of the flows are into these 20 largest businesses, it will come as no surprise to learn that actually that's where the most attention and research is focused. So if you're looking at something like Vodafone or Shell, you're getting 40 <coughs> sell-side analysts uh, looking at those positions where, as if you look at uh, our core market, so sub, uh, sub 150 million in market caps, so the micro cap space, you're, you have less than one analyst per business. And where you look at, or when you look at sub 500 million in market cap, still less than four analysts per business. Um, and bearing in mind that these analysts are typically writing one to two pages of A4 uh, at each set of results, it's not a huge leap to understand that you know, if we do our due diligence properly, we can get a better level of understanding. So there's much more inefficiency meaning that we can get an informational advantage over the wider market and our peer group. So there's much more opportunity in terms of the volume of businesses. Um, there is much more inefficiency allowing us to get that informational advantage, uh, but there's actually much more value as well. So um, there's actually the opportunity to buy these businesses at like a 50% less than their larger counterparts. Uh, meaning that we can very much take that bottom-up value strategy and, and get these uh, attractive business models for a much better price. Now, ultimately, that results in um, an active stock-picking process and, and a, a concentrated, uh, high-conviction portfolio of about 40 positions, um, and that is uh, the Downing Monthly Income Fund. So the way we go about doing this is uh, uh, to focus on four key performance principles. 
um, that have been empirically proven to outperform over the longer term. Um, now, the first is that smaller businesses outperform. Um, so we know that since the end of 92, um, the small cap index has outperformed the wider market by 1,500%. Um, so I think it's really important to emphasize um, how much that outperformance uh, can contribute, even though people really understand that small can grow quickly. We also focus on efficient operations. So here, using a metric called the uh, Piotrowski F-score to track uh, nine accounting ratios for direction of travel. Um, and those businesses that are most efficient have outperformed by 360% over uh, the long term. Strong balance sheets, again, um, almost, uh, almost kind of overplayed here, but actually from looking at the Merton's distance to the fault metric, we can see that the top quintile uh, in this space um, have had 45% lower maximum drawdowns. Um, and also, when you combine the strong balance sheets with smaller businesses, you see that there's a much lower level of overall volatility uh, for a much higher risk-adjusted return, so three times higher risk-adjusted return. And then the last point is on the secure and growing dividends. Uh, and this is, is really the, kind of the bedrock of what this fund is about. So um, the analysis that we've done concludes that actually um, when a business has a capital constraint placed upon it in the form of a dividend, it's forced to make uh, more focused capital allocation decisions, thereby only investing in uh, those internal external opportunities that will generate the highest return on invested capital. Um, and in fact, if you strip out the income and compounding uh, from the returns of the UK equity income sector, the capital only return has matched that of the total market in itself. Um, so these businesses are much better at creating value, whether you need the income or, or not. And, and to that end, we have an accumulation share class in the income fund and also a distributing uh, share class in the income fund also. So this should give us the best chance to outperform over the long term. Now comes the interesting bit, which is the actual underlying positions. Um, and there's a lot of information here, so I apologize, it's quite hard to read, especially uh, from the back. Um, but what you're really looking at is the direction of travel. So you've got earnings per share in the blue bars here, and then you've got dividend per share in the gray bars, and then you've got the actual share price and capital value in the green line in the middle. And you can see intuitively how they track and, and, and the earnings on the pins of dividend, and as well as uh, the, um, the valuation of the share price itself. Now, Adept uh, is a cracking business. They were uh, speaking today. Um, so Ian and John were in, and their new COA, Phil, um, talking about what they've been doing in the unified communication space. So we know that actually Adept has got a fantastic uh, degree of revenue visibility to its managed services line, reducing the risk. So always trying to take risk out of the portfolio. And in fact, on the last set of results, that, that level of recurring revenue increased up to 74%. Um, we've known Adept for a very long time. Um, so Judith, who heads our team, has, has known them since the IPO. Um, and to that end, that gives us the level of conviction to have this as a core holding within our client funds. So we hold 13% of the underlying equity. So uh, this qualifies as a strategic investment uh, from the Downing public equity perspective. Now, the reason that I want to talk about Adept is because it's been very acquisitive over the long term. So nine acquisitions for 48 million in total um, since 2010. Now, the reason that that's important because it's also had to pay this progressive dividend policy, so growing dividends at 10% a year. Now, that's forced it to focus on its capital allocation decisions and meant that it, it can't run too quickly. It can't uh, just go out and buy any business it wants to. It has to be very targeted. And it's chosen to acquire in areas that are strategically important for it rather than just trying to bootstrap revenue. And that has meant that it's made very good uh, capital allocation decisions. And you can see that in the uh, earnings per share uh, appreciation. So 700% total growth, 41% uh, annualized. The 1% or 1 pence, sorry, dividend 
moving out to 9p, so 61% annualised distribution growth. And for me, as an income fund manager, that is what's a really exciting piece. So there are many opportunities to get high initial yields in the marketplace, but what I'm most interested in is the yield on cost. So not the yield that I'll get in one year, but the distributional yield that I'll get in years two and years three and years four. And actually, if you look at that over the long term with a depth, you'll see that actually, yes, you'd have accepted a lower initial yield, only one and a half percent. Not particularly attractive in its own right. But if you held it through from 2012 up to 2018, that yield on cost would have been 26%. So for me, that's incredibly attractive. And actually the forecast that we're looking at for the income fund indicate that we'll be seeing 15% distribution growth over the coming 12 months. Um, so ADEPT is a, is a great example of that capital constraint coming from the dividend policy. Photo me. So the reason I want to talk about photo me um, is largely because at the moment we've been seeing, or well in recent re weeks we've been seeing, um, an increasing disconnection between the fundamentals of an underlying business and the pricing that we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, and with PhotoMe, uh, what's really happened here is, is well, the original investment case was predicated on uh, a roll out of their photo booths. So these are the photo booths that you'll have seen in train stations and, and, and supermarkets, et cetera. Not just in the UK, across Europe as well, and also in the East. Um, but the investment case was predicated on uh, the Japanese uh, government uh, introducing a new law that would require all citizens to have a new photo ID card. Um, that created a huge amount of attention and a huge amount of supply uh, being put into the Japanese market by PhotoMe included. Now the Japanese government then decided actually this isn't going to be a requirement, it's going to be an option. And actually it turns out that not many people want to have a new photo ID card. So the market's incredibly oversupplied and that has uh, spurred a restructuring of that division of PhotoMe. Now that all sounds very disruptive. It's gonna cost PhotoMe about three million pounds as a one-off um, and that's, obviously um, a negative, but it completely overshadows the underlying growth story that's coming from the second division, which is the uh, unmanned laundry services. Um, so with PhotoMe, they have this fantastic network effect. They have uh, a great connection with all their underlying landlords, meaning that when they're putting their photo booths in, they can then put in one of these unmanned laundry booths at the same time. Um, the return on capital of those laundry booths is one year. Uh, so they've been rolling out 800 to 1,000 of these over the last three years, in each of the last three years. And there is no sign of slowing. They've got a fantastic network, as I say, so they can continue plugging these booths into their existing sites. Now that means that actually this, uh, the laundry business that's contributing about 25 million pounds at the moment will step out to 100 million. Um, and we can see that giving visibility for uh, you know, a target price of 182p, 58% upside at this point. At the same time, you've got a lot of risk reduction coming through. So net, cal net cash balance sheet, 25 million pounds and, and an acyclical business model. So people are going to continue to need new photographs and to have dirty clothes, um, regardless of the point in the economic cycle. So separating away from that cyclicality that seems to be the front of everybody's mind at the moment. So photo me, great example of that disconnection uh, from the fundamentals. Main tell uh, actually is, is another example of that, uh, where you see this share price here coming back. You see the fantastic earnings progression that we've had coming through the dividend, much higher uh, at this point, so yield on cost, 6.7% initially, stepping out to over 40% um, from 2009 to 2017, 22% annualized dividend growth, 10% earnings growth a year, exactly the kind of dividend incubator that we're looking for within the income fund. But the reason I'm talking about it here is to underline why uh, this uh, focus on efficiency is so important. So Maintel has never scored uh, an F score lower than five in each of the last 10 years. 
and has averaged 6.1. So one of the more efficient businesses in the space. And that's really underpinned the earnings progression over that period. They have been ac acquisitive at the same time. And um, there was an external event that caused this shock to the share price. Um, so the Avaya business uh, being placed in chapter uh, 11 protection um, is now come out of that and we're seeing the recovery in that part of the business at the moment. But the investment case for Maintel as far as uh, the income fund is concerned is not predicated on you know, dramatic top line growth at this point. It's all coming through from uh, synergies and operational efficiencies that management has proven they can drive through over the years. So management are guiding towards a 1% margin increase in each of the next two years. And that really leads to a share price which is much more up towards the kind of uh, £10 level rather than the kind of four and a half, five pounds that we're seeing at the moment. Um, but it's, it's this lack of understanding um, that it, it is really kind of the source of our informational advantage. And at the same time, we're able to kind of capitalize on that and, and reap the benefits over the long term. Um, again, risk reduction coming from revenue visibility and a forward order book, meaning that actually um, you know, they don't have to go out and replace all of their revenues each year um, and reducing uh, the, the, kind of the, the risk on the revenue side. Um, what Maintel actually does is, is provide services where they transition on-premises IT solutions and communications to off-premises cloud services. So moving from um, a kind of one-off fee structure much more towards a recurring revenue model um, with a long-term subscription base, high switching costs, much higher quality business in the round. Lock and store. So the reason that I've uh, pulled out lock and store um, is because of the level of asset backing within the portfolio. So you talked about balance sheet strength as being one of the core performance principles. Now, the net asset value per share of this business is £4.80. You can buy it today for £4.25. Lock and store is a smaller version of Big Yellow that you'll be familiar with, uh, Safe Store, another alternative, much larger. Those businesses are trading at a 40% premium to their net asset value. Now, we don't model any uh, re-rating in the shares. What we do have visibility on is the pipeline of new sites that are coming through. So we can see out uh, five years and we can see what, which sites in the pipeline will start trading. And we know that it takes two to three years to gain maturity. Um, and then putting all those pieces of the puzzle together, we can get to a, a, a point where we can get good visibility on kind of an eight to 10 pound share price. So you know, fantastic upside to be had here with downside protection. You know, the, uh, the quality of the revenue streams, again, very important to me. Um, the level of churn that they're experiencing in this type of business is actually very low. And again, not connected with economic conditions. So the dividend incubation coming through, 35% dividend growth a year. So you'd have had a lower yield on cost again here at 1.8%, but now receiving nearly 20% uh, on that original cost. Fantastic capital growth at the same time, over 436%. So the asset backing there, again, reducing the risk profile. And so here's just a, a couple of uh, summary points on the fund. So the, the yield on the fund at the moment is, uh, is 5% targeting 4% uh, as a minimum. We have no FTSE 100 exposure whatsoever. Uh, so as I say, kind of 40-odd analysts up in that space, we can gain our informational advantage down at the very small end of things. Um, that's where we should be playing. That's where the opportunities are largest. Um, we do have a liquidity buffer. Uh, so we can invest up to 4 billion in market cap. There are still good opportunities there. That ensures that we have sufficient liquidity to manage ins and outs. And as you've probably gathered, total shareholder return focus uh, with this, in this concentration in the smaller companies end of things. Private equity investment process, value their bottom up as you'd expect, um, and the ability to co-invest alongside the wider suite of downing uh, public equity funds, namely the Strategic Investment Trust, where we're taking three to 25% of the underlying equity and that gives us the ability to uh, work with management in the case of ADEPT or 
um, in fact, dupe real royalty um, and, and help them define their communication strategy and the uh, kind of long-term focus of the business. High conviction portfolio, 30 to 40 positions, um, and really good investor value there with a capped OCF at 1%. This is what you would have received had you invested £10,000 in the monthly income fund in, uh, at the end of March 2012. So your £10,000 growing up to about 13 and a half in the income share class, you'd also have received an income distribution equivalent to uh, 4,000 pounds on the left-hand side there. So if you combine those two together, you get up to a 17,500 pound return on your original 10,000 pound investment. The stakes that you're taking, I mean, in something mm. like Maintel, it's got mm. an absolutely enormous spread, hasn't it? I mean, once you're in, can you get out? Can you get, it's a, it's a really good question across you know, the whole of the portfolio. Um, and liquidity, especially in these current markets, is something that we're very focused on. Um, so the investment committee monitors this each month. Um, and, and yes, you're right, absolutely, in the less liquid positions, it, it can be hard to get more liquidity. But that's why it's very important to do this uh, long private equity style due diligence process on the way in so we can mitigate that downside risk uh, along the investment life cycle. So what's your average turnover? I'm guessing it's very low given the strategy. You're not mm. looking to get in and out. So what, how much of the portfolio gets turned over every year? So we're looking at a three to five year holding period um, for each of our investments, which equates to about 30% liquidity, plus or minus 10%. And are you looking to buy the dips at the moment or are you just maintaining liquidity buffer in case of redemptions? So there are some good opportunities that are coming through. So actually we are starting to build up a little bit of cash at the moment because we want to have uh, the ability to take advantage over, over these kind of short term opportunities. But having said that, we aren't you know, turning into short term traders, absolutely not. We are very much long term investors, but it's more actually can I buy a little bit more at a more attractive price now and hold that rather than you know, buying it at the beginning of the month and selling it at the end of the month. So you're sticking to your existing holdings, you might just be topping up a little bit. Yes, quite. Uh, just a quick one for me. So mm. I guess you pointed out um, some of the great investments that you've done. So just looking at your graph, I'm assuming if you'd invested at the beginning, your current yield on cost would be what, about 6 or or 7%? Um, yeah, I haven't actually done that, done that calculation from the beginning of the portfolio. Um, but absolutely, I mean, if you're starting to see this, uh, kind of 10% compounding over the long term, then you know you, you can extrapolate from there from a 5% starting yield, which is where we are now. And then, as I say, looking for 15% uh, into next year or to the end of 2020, um, uh, the funds year end is March, uh, and uh, looking at a good 10% growth thereafter. So I've certainly got good visibility from this point on a yield on cost of 6%. Uh, James, we could put our hands together for James. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.